Hi, my name is Connie Coquinas and you're watching the video field of BSV. In this video, we'll be discussing how to assess a patient's field of BSV and looking at how to relate the field of BSV to incompetent strabismus. So we're all aware that the visual field consists of a binocular visual field and a monocular visual field. And the monocular visual field is in the periphery. As we can see here, this is the monocular field of the left eye and this of the right eye. And here we have the binocular visual field. Now the reason this is of interest in incompetent strabismus is because patients with incompetent strabismus often have an area of BSV. So they'll have an area where they have double vision and an area where they have BSV. And so what we're interested in mapping is which areas are diplopic and which areas do the patient, does the patient have BSV within so that we can gain a better understanding of their visual field and their binocular visual field. This will correlate to the uh, mapping of the diplopia. So if on the diplopia chart you have areas of BSV or single vision, they will correlate to this, the field of BSV. There should be a direct relationship between the two. Okay, what does the normal field of BSV look like? Here we can see the normal um, field of BSV, and it's that which is shaded. And it's approximately 45 to 50 degrees from prime position. But be aware that obviously what will happen is as you come into down gaze, we have a narrowing of that field because of the nose. So when do we use um, or when do we assess a patient's field of BSV? Well, a patient obviously has double vision and what we're interested in is mapping the areas of double vision and quantifying that area. It also gives an indication of that functional impact that the limitation of the ocular movements or the um, diplopia is having on the patient. So generally speaking, if the area of BSV is in prior position or, or close to prior position, this will be better for the patient. So as you can imagine, it is easier if when you're looking straight ahead, you have an area of BSV. If it's out in the periphery, then it's much more difficult for the patient to achieve BSV in their day-to-day -day activities or during their day-to-day -day activities. It's better obviously if you have a larger area of BSV, the more area of BSV you have, the more opportunity the patient has to be able to gain BSV during their day-to-day -day activities. And down gaze is better to have BSV than up gaze because up gaze we don't use as regularly. Down gaze is a much more utilised position, uh, particularly in activities such as reading. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of an appreciation how the area of BSV can translate into some level of appreciation for impact in terms of function for the patient. How do we go about assessing the patient? We use the Goldman and we set up the patient as we would usually on a visual field exam for a visual field examination, but this time we'll centre them on the actual uh, instrument rather than trying to put the right eye or the left eye into fixation. We usually use a 2-4-E and we must instruct the patient that they need to keep their head still during this examination and follow the light or the target that we produce. So whilst the patient is following the target, what you're trying to gain is information about whether they see one light or two lights. It's usually easier to start off from a position of where you see one light and then move towards uh, when the patient has two lights. In some instances, this might be very difficult, in which case you might go from two to one. And as you progress, you'll mark the areas of BSV versus those of diplopia. Now, you can actually use goggles to assist you, so red-green goggles to assist you in this examination, but some clinicians do not like utilising it, and there are pros and cons to utilising red-green goggles during this testing. So the disadvantage is that you've dissociated your patient through using red-green goggles and often this will result in a, a smaller binocular visual field. So it's not as representative of what the real situation is when you use red-green goggles. There are, however, advantages. One is that the patient can more readily appreciate diplopia because all of a sudden they'll see two lights, one red, one green. The other is you as the examiner have a better appreciation if indeed the area or when the patient indicates that they have one light, that it is indeed um, binocular single vision and not suppression. 
So without the red-green goggles, you have no information regarding whether the single light is produced by binocularity or through suppression. So usually where, if you're using a red-green goggles, um, if the patient is suppressing, they'll see only a red or a green light. However, if they've got BSV, they will talk to you about a, a colour that's quite mixed, not quite red, not quite green. And of course, diplopia is very easy. They'll, the patient will, will communicate to you that they see one red and one green. Okay, most clinicians don't use red green goggles, but it's worth being aware that this is, a, is an option, particularly if you have a patient struggling to communicate to you uh, what they're seeing. In terms of recording, here is a recording of a area of BSV or the field of BSV. So we record on a chart as per usual that we would for uh, recording the visual field. And what we can see here is that the shaded areas represent the areas of double vision and the area that's unshaded is the area of BSV. So for this patient, we have a central area of BSV. The BSV consists of the primary position and there is diplopia in elevation and depression and obviously in these peripheral areas also. In terms of the functional impact, given that this patient has no diplopia in primary position, they're going to have less of an impact or a negative impact on their function. This patient has particular issues when they look down or up, and so with activities such as reading, they may have issues. And this is where the patient might need to move their reading um, material further up or higher into the area of BSV so they don't have the, um, the diplopia uh, impacting on their ability to read, for instance, as an example. Okay, <clears throat> how do we interpret the field of BSV? There are three things uh, that we'll look at the position, size and shape. Now in terms of position, the position can give us some indication of the likely affected muscle. And whilst we don't use the field of BSV for this purpose, it obviously can be utilised to further support your theory or your diagnosis that this is the affected muscle. How does it do this? Well, you already know that the deviation, if you have a neurogenic palsy, the deviation will be greatest in the field of gaze where that particular muscle is working or is acting. Let's take an example of the left inferior rectus. Its field of action is in lavo depression. So generally we would expect that the deviation will be greatest in lavo depression. Okay, this would mean that the diplopia would be greatest in this position. So theoretically, the deviation would be least in the direct opposite position of where the field of action is. So in that patient, we would expect that the position of the visual field would be in dextro elevation. So where we have a series of investigations that are indicating that this is likely to be a left inferior rectus palsy, if we mapped the field of BSV, we would expect to find the area of BSV somewhere in the region of dextro elevation. Okay, in terms of size, this is going to give us information regarding how limited the eye movements are and how much of an impact it's having on the area of BSV. Now, generally speaking, if you have a patient who has strong fusional amplitudes, they may be able to overcome smaller amounts of deviation so you will have these patients having greater area of BSVs than other patients. In terms of shape, uh, this gives us some indication often of whether we're looking at a neurogenic or a mechanical restriction. In a neurogenic palsy, the area of BSV generally corresponds to the opposite direction of the affected muscle. In mechanical restrictions, on the other hand, you end up with narrow, narrow fields and you see the diplopia affecting a range of positions, such as the entire range of elevation, the entire range of depression. Okay, let's go through some examples. Here we have a patient who's had their area of BSV mapped. And what we can see is that the patient has double vision in LAVO elevation. Okay, our next thought is that given that the area of BSV is in LAVO elevation, we expect that the affected muscle will have its field of action in the directly opposite position, so dextro depression. 
And in dextro depression, we have two muscles that work in that position, the right inferior rectus and the left superior oblique. Now, the field of BSV cannot give us any further information in terms of isolating which of those two is likely. All we know is it's probably one of those two muscles. Okay, it is your other investigations that will identify which is the affected muscle. Okay, let's do another example. Here we have a patient whose area of BSV is in dextra elevation. So we expect that the affected muscle must be in directly opposite position, which is lavo depression. And in lavo depression, the two muscles that work in this position or have their field of action in this position are the left inferior rectus and the right superior oblique. So one of these is it likely to be the affected muscle. In this example, the area of BSV is in right gaze. Now, this indicates that the issue must be in left gaze. So the two muscles that are utilised here are the left lateral rectus and the right medial rectus. So one of these is likely to be affected. Okay, and last example is the one we saw earlier um, when we were discussing recording of the area of BSV. And here we have a narrowing um, of the field in terms of we have diplopia above and below the area of BSV, and this is a mechanical restriction. So in summary, the area of BSV would generally be directly opposite to the area of limitation of the eye movements. So it can give you some information about what is the likely affected muscle, but generally speaking, it's going to provide support for your um, diagnosis and give you an idea of the functional impact that this um, diplopia and the limited eye movements are having on the patient. Okay, the position of the area of BSV is, is more important than the size of the area. And this means that if the position is in prior position, this is gonna be far better for the patient, even if it's smaller, than if you have a larger visual field and it's fairly out to the periphery. Okay, and always remember that a mechanical restriction will demonstrate narrow fields. Okay, that brings us to the conclusion of this video. Thank you for watching.